Figuring these registers from the data sheet is possible, but it involves a lot of arithmetic, and engineers are lazy. So they want proprietary Windows tools to calculate the values for them. So generally what you do is you run this program called SmartRF Studio, and it presents you with a list of the register values that you'll be using in your own code. Among other things, you can set up a um, template in, um, I forget whether it's XML or, or Perl, but you set up a template, and then uh, it will generate those settings to match your source code style. So you can have it export the registers to a uh, Python array, or to a C array, or to whatever your internal code is using. Um, this becomes a good starting point, but then you need to manually adjust the values in order to actually match your target. I always begin a new standard by implementing the register settings in Python until I begin to get back individual packets on my Unix command line. And at this stage of development, I am completely away from my receiver hardware. Um, I will usually go to a coffee house, SSH home, and then use the equipment remotely just so that I can get out of the lab for a while and be away from it. Because there's no reason to touch the physical hardware while something else is your mystery. Um, the radio configuration registers themselves are unique to the type of radio you're dealing with and like as a, a vendor or a chip family. And then even within a family, they will usually be different for the 2.4 gig models and the sub gigahertz models. The sub gigahertz models will be less configurable. Um, sorry, the 2.4 gig will be less configurable because um, of, I guess, regulation reasons or compatibility reasons. Um, so the sub gigahertz level, you have to choose how wide your filter bandwidth is and what your deviation is and all of these other fancy settings. At 2.4 gig, you generally just say uh, what channel number you're on. You can't even choose an individual frequency. Um, then you specify a rate, and the rate won't be an exact bit timing like you do in the sub gigahertz models. Instead, it will just be one megabit per second or two. Uh, and also the modulation matters. Like, is this two FSK in which the higher frequency is a one and the lower frequency is a zero? Or is it four FSK in which you have multiple steps and encode two bits per symbol? Um, in addition to the, the five layer fields, there are also some digital fields like the start frame delimiter. Um, the transmitter will send this before every packet that goes out. So if you need to avoid the transmitter's own framing, you can corrupt this to something else. And that will just look like background noise to the receiver. Um, there's also a, a length field, which the receiver can optionally use in order to buffer up the packet for you, so that your microcontroller can be alerted when the complete packet has arrived and is waiting in a buffer ready to be read. The alternative to that is that your microcontroller might need to race the packet transmission, flushing bytes out of the radio's buffers so that it doesn't overfill. You have to do this for um, very long transmissions, which are commonly found in voice and paging. Um, but you won't for short chirps that you would find in like home automation sensors and things like that. Um, so in order to get like the very first packet out, you just need to know your symbol rate, like how fast are these symbols coming in. Your modulation, like are you turning the radio on and off or are you changing its frequency? You need to know the deviation if you are transmitting, which is um, how wide of a channel you're actually using. Or in 2FSK, it's the, the distance and frequency between a one and a zero. Um, on the receiving end, you care more about the filter bandwidth. And the filter bandwidth is a tricky thing to decide upon because if you make it too narrow, then you might miss a transmission that is slightly off in frequency. And if you make it too wide, then you might be blinded by a loud transmission to the side when your real transmission is coming on exactly the frequency. But luckily, in reverse engineering, we can set aside the question of performance until after we get things working. Now, 
in Poxag, we have a, a defined standard that we can read, and it says that the symbol rate is 1200 baht. It says that it's 2 FSK, which means that the um, that you have a, one frequency for a 1 and a different frequency for a 0, and you switch between them. The deviation is defined as 12.5 kilohertz. Older networks will use 25. And uh, the filter bandwidth, like 200, um, I think that should say kilohertz, is fine. Um, and the starter frame delimiter is described. 7C D2 15D8. As far as the receiver is concerned, everything that comes in on that channel is garbage and background noise until it sees those 32 bits, and that's when it knows to begin measuring the symbols reading the packet. And then we get to the real world complications where all of this is ever so slightly wrong. So the symbol rate of 1200 baud is like the standard definition, but the chip itself doesn't need to know that. The chip itself needs to know how wide a bit is, and that is 8.33 times 10 to the negative fourth seconds per symbol. So that's easy. We're just like inverting a fraction here. Um, but then it comes to modulation. So modulation is inverted to FSK, which means that a 1 is the lower frequency and a 0 is the higher frequency. And the, um, the deviation of the filter bandwidth are the same, um, but that means because our 1s and our 0s are upside down, our packet will arrive in the buffer upside down, and we need to match on the inverse of the starter frame delimiter. So instead of uh, 7CD2, we have to match on 832D. And the same is true for all of the bits in our packet. Every single one of them will be uh, inverted. So we have to XOR them with Fs after they arrive. We also need a transmitter to work with. Um, you're not going to be able to make this work if you do it entirely blind with nothing to test against, because any small mistake would then snowball into nothing working. So we have a uh, POCSEC transmitter here in the form of an MMDVM board. This is a, a cute little attachment that you throw into a Raspberry Pi that allows it to speak P25, DMR, uh, POCSAG, and many other UHF and uh, VHF protocols. And we need a network so that we can send a packet to this device. So I've been testing through DAPNet, um, which is the Decentralized Amateur Paging Network. Uh, if you're a ham radio operator, you can register for a pager number through them and then order a pager to receive from the network, or build your own. And then there's a handy little website and a cell phone app that allows you to send a page. At this point, we can finally break out the software-defined radio and record a signal and then compare it to the values that we calculated from the standard. Um, down here at the bottom are the actual zeros and ones of the message. Um, probably can't focus at this distance, but it begins with a whole lot of 1010101010. The preamble is 480 milliseconds long, almost half a second. And that's how your pagers have such good battery life. Your beeper will be off for 400 milliseconds, and then it will turn on just to see if a packet is coming, and if it's not, it turns everything all the way off again. So that one AA battery can last for months of uptime. Far better than any handheld voice radio. So we begin by recording a legitimate packet with this SDR, measuring it to learn the parameters, and then uh, when they're correct, we can parse the decoded bits as strings and begin building our software, software parser for the incoming packets. Then after we get the right register settings, where our guess is at them, we try them out in Python connected to our receiver board over a serial port. This way, when we make mistakes, they're easy to fix. We can try things out live on the interpreted Python command line. And the results come out to a Unix shell so that like, um, if something is working unreliably, we can just correct for the right answer. Or um, uh, export it into another Python class to begin writing a, a decoder on the host so that we understand the problem before we sit down to write firmware. Uh, and we do this because Fixing mistakes inside of the watch without a command line is a lot harder than fixing them on the desktop 
with all the resources and logging in the world. Um, after we then understand the problem in Python on the host, we write a parser library in C to run host side with test cases. Again, away from the hardware. And then finally, we make the two meet in the middle um, by having a good parser library, having um, our C code running inside of the radio, and then making an interactive application to show the incoming papers. This is my um, a test device. It's a watch wired to a USB serial adapter, uh, much like the one that came with your badges. Um, it has no display, it has no keypad, it has no buttons because everything is being done host side. As I use it, I have a Python script that connects to it, and then it dumps back raw packets, which I can then begin to parse. Again, I write the parser in C. This section of the C code has a main method. If standalone is defined, it knows that it's being compiled to run on my desktop, and I run all of the tests in AMD64 Linux away from the watch so that I know that my code is correct before I begin moving it into firmware. And then when I move it into firmware, it works. Or this being B-sides, we, uh, we can send that message. This is uh, a page being received in a wristwatch with about six hours of battery life more than enough to cheat in a pub quiz. <laughs> no one from Knox Trivia Guys is here, right? All right, cool. Um, so that was a, a lot of work, right? We had many different stages. What we would much rather do is take the easy way out and reuse what's already available in, in a hardware receiver to sort of shortcut the process and know in advance what the, what the right settings are. So on, on many of these devices, um, the configuration and the packets are exposed over an SPI bus. This is the same protocol that your laptop uses to grab a copy of the BIOS from the flash ROM chip. Um, so we can just copy its configuration out. Um, by sniffing it and then replaying it into our own chip. Um, again, thank you kindly to the Steve Baker Corporation of America for making this possible. Um, so uh, for this target, we're going to use the next Hope Batch, um, which I designed for the Hope Conference in 2010. Um, on the left, actually, I can highlight stuff. So on the left, we have this chip here. And uh, this chip is an MSP430 running the uh, Open Beacon firmware. Um, throughout the conference, these badges would beep out like a little packet. And then there were receivers uh, running Open Beacon uh, infrastructure software that would record these packets and try to triangulate through the packet error rate figuring out where the attendees were at all times. It was like um, some artistic mumbo jumbo about surveillance. Um, and then over here on the right side of the board, this much smaller chip, that is the actual radio. This is an NRF 24L01 plus. Um, it has its own crystal. It, um, it has most of the analog components on the board involved in its filtering. And that's what actually sends out the packets to the air. Um, and it's fully capable of receiving them, even though that wasn't used in the Open Beacon firmware as configured uh, at this event. So um, the radio chip uh, pointed to by this arrow has its own copper traces. And the, um, the microcontroller has its own copper traces that connects to them. And they connect on um, this little sequence of pads here, which is perhaps better seen in the photograph. So these pins break out the SPI bus. Uh, I did this as like uh, an expansion port so that you could add a new device in addition to the radio to your badge. Um, but it's also very handy in sniffing the connection between the CPU and the radio. And you can use this in order to watch the CPU configure the radio. Because every time the radio is powered on, the CPU will write into it the channel that it uses, the, um, 
the, the data rate, the modulation type, the started frame delimiter, all of the settings that you need to participate in the Open Beacon network are loaded into this chip. And if you replay them into another Nordic RF chip, you'll then be able to sniff the packets that come out of the Open Beacon network. Um, it, it, it's not Wi-Fi, it's not Bluetooth, it's its own thing, but you can become compatible with it just by tapping those wires. Um, back in the day, you would use a dedicated logic analyzer. Uh, you would use a dedicated protocol sniffer for this, like the Beagle from Total Phase. Uh, nowadays, the Sidley devices are more than fast and more than reliable enough. So uh, you just run the, the pins from here to the board that you're trying to tap. And then um, the, the signals will come out of it, and you tell it which pin means what, like uh, which one is the data from the the host to the device, and which one is from the device to the host, and which one is the clock. And with those three, it's able to parse the entire recording and tell you every transaction that occurred between the CPU chip and the radio chip. Um, and usually, you grab these settings just after reset. But you also get the packets that go across. In the case of the Open Beacon firmware, the radio is held off, and it never receives any packets. But if you have something that is communicating bidirectionally is receiving from the network, then you can see the packets themselves come in over the bus. And that can be enough for a sniffer without having to write any firmware of your own or build any hardware of your own. Um, there's also a, a lovely case that a lot of these microcontrollers were too low power to support hardware acceleration of cryptography. So the radio vendors said, hey, that's not so hard and we're making our chip anyways. Let's add AES to it. But then you have the situation that the radio chip is encrypting the packet that is outbound or decrypting the packet that is inbound away from the CPU, and the clear text packet is exposed over the bus. And on those devices, not only do you get all the radio configuration settings, but it also takes care of undoing the cryptography for you so that you can sniff the packets in the raw, which is very handy. Um, now, Many boards won't tap out all of the spy pins as easily as um, like a development board or a HackerCon badge will. For those, I use uh, hypodermic syringes. Uh, I just stick a wire down the barrel and then poke them into the board. Um, not only can you poke them into vias as I'm doing here, but if you're careful, you can also hit a, a wire trace. And the sharp end of the needle allows you to push it through the solder mask in order to touch the exposed board. Um, you generally do this at the experimenting stage, and then you switch to very thin wire after you know which are the right pins to tap. And at the end result, you get uh, clear text packets. And you're then on the network of this strange device for which you have no documentation. Now, as technology moves forward and time marches on, especially in the very lowest power devices, the radios are beginning to become combined with the microcontroller. And in these cases, you have no exposed spy bus that you can tap. Instead, you need to read out the uh, firmware and then look at the firmware to see what's going on. But as before, you're lazy and you want to do this as quickly as possible. So after you rip the code out, um, either through exploiting the bootloader, or through um, reading a firmware update, or finding an unlocked chip in an early prototype device, or just an early serial number before they locked everything down. Um, you have this blob and you have to figure out where the radio code is inside of what might be like a, a very large application. So um, inside of the device, the um, the radio is still connected to the CPU somehow. And if you can find the development guide for the CPU, it will tell you that you write uh, a byte to this address in order to send it off to the radio. And you read the reply from this other address. And you can search for these addresses within the code, um, as well as, as features of how the, the packets are formatted. So for example, in uh, DMR, a, um, an address is um, a 
forget how many bits long, but they all have a, a mask against them. It, I think it's zero FFF. So everywhere in the DMR code that you see something being um, bitwise ANDed with zero FFF, that's involving the addressing of the DMR network layer. Um, let's take a simple example, which is the turning point clicker. Um, I like using this as an example because when I was a graduate student, they threatened to sue me. <laughs> um, so the, the clicker is a classroom remote control. So um, I, I don't know when you left college, but about 2007, this new trend started. And everyone said, hey, you know what students would really love? They'd love to blow $50 on an electronic gizmo at the bookstore that they can't make themselves. So here's how we're going to make one ourselves. Um, so this uses a chip called the NRF24E1. And the 24E1 is a 2.4 gigahertz uh, transceiver. It operates in 2 FSK at 1 megabit per second. And when you push a button on your, on your clicker, like the one button in the top left, um, that connects the pads, the firmware wakes up, and it transmits your serial number along with your guess. The instructor then receives uh, votes from the class and can use it for classroom participation grades. Um, although with the range of these things, you better hope that you're not sitting in the back of the classroom. Um, The, the bug here, the vulnerability that prevents the design from being protected, is this little chip here, U2. So this chip is the Nordic RF radio, and it's also the CPU. But when you're adding a radio and a CPU into the same package, that's easy. When you have a memory package and you add a CPU on top of that, that's also easy. When a CPU manufacturer is trying to add both a radio and flash at the same time, that becomes rather hard. So rather than try, they have this other chip out at the side, and that contains their reprogrammable memory. The Nordic RF chip here boots from internal mask ROM that then copies the actual application out of the reprogrammable chip. And this ugly wiring over here taps that out using the same bus that they used in the factory, which allows us to read out all of the firmware and then have a copy of it to reverse engineer it in a desktop computer. Now, in order to load it, we need to know a couple of things. We need to know the uh, architecture of the firmware image because each one of these devices will use a different instruction set. Um, in the case of the, the turning point clicker, it's an 805.1. Um, which is very old Intel 8-bit architecture that's fun to work with and has excellent support in uh, IDEC. We also need to know the loading address. Um, sometimes code is loaded to address 0. Um, other times it goes to a higher address, like uh, 1100 is a common loading point in MSP430, and uh, 0800 and change is a popular loading address for ARM. Um, you also need to know where the register addresses are. You can find this either in the data sheet or in the header files for the development kit. Um, the header files will declare that a particular variable is volatile and it's located within the I.O. region. Um, and it will just have hundreds of these things for everything from general purpose I.O. pins to uh, interacting with the radio. And once you know their names, you can search for the, the juicy ones. Um, you should always sanity check the firmware before you begin digging into it because it's easy to think that things are working right if it's loaded to an incorrect address. Um, for example, in the embedded ARM code, uh, which is called thumb, uh, function calls these program, relative, program counter relative addressing. So if you load your image to the, the wrong address, all of the function calls will look right, but none of the function pointers will look right. Okay, um, so we begin with the basics, right? Um, we know that there will be functions inside of the code that use the I.O. ports, um, and we also know that there will be functions which read global variables. 
So um, if we see code interacting with a particular address as part of sending a packet, like uh, the destination address field, for example, we can mark those addresses in our reverse engineering tool. Um, I.O. ports are even better because they're like global variables that can't move and are the same for everything in that, uh, everything that might possibly be compiled for that ship. So uh, we can use this to identify like the, the valuable low-level functions and then work outward from there to the parent functions that call these low-level ones that we've identified. Um, so the first thing that I look for is the function that receives and transmits a byte over the SPI bus. Um, this is that function from the turning point clicker firmware. Um, now it's important to understand that a SPI bus can have more than one uh, slave device attached to it, and that these are distinguished by a chip select pin. So you use the chip select pin to choose which chip you want to talk to, and then you send the data across. But everything that sends data to either the, um, the radio or the EEPROM will go over this function. Now, I mentioned before that the radio is not a separate chip, but here I'm saying that it's still over the spy bus. In order to simplify their manufacturing and their chip layout, they just put a CPU core right next to the radio core as if they were wired together on a PCB. So it's using the same wiring. We then can identify the, uh, all of the function calls that are made to this function. So this list continues off the screen, but this is a list of everywhere in the firmware image that a byte is received and transmitted over the SPI bus. Um, when I first saw this list, of course, I didn't know what any of those other functions did. But I could begin looking into them by how often they called the function or by what else they had, until eventually I had the names for all of them. So this function down here transmits the packet. And this function here writes the configuration. And these functions down here uh, read from the external spy flash. And then um, these functions I haven't gotten around to reverse engineering yet, uh, but I don't need them because I found everything that I needed elsewhere in the code. So when you've got a firmware image of hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of functions, you generally ignore everything that doesn't immediately relate to the mystery that you're trying to solve. You're not trying to convert the entire thing back to source code, you're just trying to understand enough of it that you could reproduce it or interact with it. So, uh, the way that spy works is that first you select the chip, and then you call the, the spy receive transmit function a bunch, like for every byte in the buffer that you want to exchange. And then you unselect the chip. So um, knowing the function that, um, that actually transmits the bytes, we can then begin looking for the instructions that select the radio. And these are documented in the data sheet for the Nordic RF system on chip device. The radio is selected by using the, um, the set B instruction to set the third bit of the radio register. Um, and then the EEPROM is selected by clearing, meaning we take it low instead of taking it high as we did for the radio, by clearing um, general purpose I.O. port zero, pin zero. And then we can identify this code and see how the radio is being set up. So, um, we see the, the calls being made, and we see that it's calling um, this function here, radio wr config. And if we jump to that, if we jump to that, we can see that um, this is really sloppy code. Instead of running through like a, a buffer, they're just calling the function 30 times in a row. Um, and we can see that it's writing um, 8, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on, until 1B, 1C, 1D, uh, and so on. Um, this is the code that actually configures the radio. And if you run this in your own board of the same chip, you have then configured your radio to function on their network. 
It's a similar function that reads out of the, uh, the spy flash. And I was confused as to why they would bother, because spy flash gets copied into the radio in RAM to actually be the program and to run. Like the, the, the small low-end equivalent of the loaders that Bex was talking about this morning. The reason for this is that they wanted to be able to read the serial number out of the EEPROM without mixing it with the code. So by finding the region in the EEPROM that had the serial number that was written in hexadecimal and a sticker on the back of the device, I was then able to know what the address field was and where to place it myself. This means that not only can I communicate on the network, but I can also go forward and backward between um, like a physical unit and its packets in the network and accurately identify who said what. And this gets us all the results that we need without ever touching a software-defined radio. We know that the radio runs at 2.441 megahertz, I should say gigahertz, um, that it runs at one megabit per second in 2FSK, and the, the trickiest part to this, the, the thing that kept me from being able to sniff these packets bef without even opening the device, was that the Nordic RF devices have uh, an unknown start of frame delimiter that marks the beginning of the packets. So without knowing that, um, at the time, I wasn't able to sniff promiscuously. I later figured that out, but did not know this at the time. Uh, so I needed to know this uh, three to five byte field that would describe where the packets begin in the air in order to tell my receiver what to match on. And this secret number that made me do all of this work turned out to be 123456. So having these parameters, you can then sniff the traffic. So you can see, like, uh, is the classroom voting for A, or are they voting for C? Uh, what's the most popular one? Uh, you can emulate it in order to transmit your own packets. So you could follow along with the majority and have a device that sat in the rafters and just always voted as a straight C student, but had perfect attendance. Um, this also tells you that you can do jamming. Um, if you just jam 2.441 gigahertz, none of these devices will get the signal to move to another channel, and the network won't function. Again, I'd like to thank the Studebaker Motor Company. God bless those fine folks. The, uh, the new 1964 models are, are really something different. See, Studebaker is different by design. Okay, so we want other fancy targets, right? Like what other devices might you apply these techniques to? Because uh, unless you are both into electrical engineering and suffering through an undergrad psychology class, you really don't care about hacking the clicker for the results of it. You care about it for the techniques of it or how it might apply to something else. So one handy target is the Titera MD380. Um, some friends and I reverse engineered this and we started um, a project that you can find on GitHub called MD380 Tools. Um, this is a $90 handheld radio. Um, it's very popular for amateur radio, but it also works on business networks. Uh, it can do either uh, the Moto Turbo digital standard or regular narrowband FM modulation. Um, and we wrote firmware patches to enable things like promiscuous mode so that you can hear all of the audio going on in the channel and know not to accidentally stomp on someone else's conversation. Um, in the business radio, this doesn't make sense because you don't want the, uh, the guys in the line over here in management talk shit about them. Um, but in amateur radio, it matters a lot because in amateur radio, before I transmit, I need to make sure that no one else is transmitting on that same repeater. And there are time slots, so two people can talk at the same time as long as they're in different time slots. And none of the commercial radios, except for the really high-end Motorola's, allow you, allowed you to do that. So you couldn't listen before you transmitted. You then weren't able to know that the channel was really clear, and people would interfere with each other all the time. Uh, with promiscuous mode, you can then hear all of the conversations and know not to interfere. We added a universal address book, so that inside of the radio firmware, um, 
we, uh, we hollowed out uh, a bunch of flash memory for our own code, but there's also an external spy flash chip with just tons of space available that wasn't used by the manufacturer code. So we replaced that with a caller ID database of every amateur radio user in the world who had registered for using this protocol. So that when you get an incoming packet, you know that it's like Jim in Arkansas and not uh, the other Jim in Philadelphia. Um, we had raw packet sniffing and injection so that you could catch all of the packets that are on the network in order to learn how the protocol really works. And we uh, ripped out the uh, audio codec, which is a proprietary codec called MB2+, and we relinked the firmware image to run as a Linux executable so that you have a command line tool that can turn packets into a wave audio file or a wave audio file back into packets. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of the Color ID database um, showing an incoming call, and you know like, the, the guy's call sign, you know his name, you know what city he's in, and what state, what country. Um, I also wrote a little um, cellular phone application that would connect to the radio through USB host mode. Um, so this is showing a log of all the calls that were made, and at the bottom it has the raw data of a text message coming. Um, the girl tech I am me was uh, uh, God, is 12 years ago this thing came out as a text messaging toy for kids whose parents didn't want to give them a real feature phone. So uh, instead of plugging the desktop computer, they could have a, a little USB dongle plugged in, and then uh, this would allow them to chat with their friends and, and get the text back. Um, the screenshot here shows it running a uh, random number generator test, the results of which showed that the ZigBee protocol for this chip was using bad random number generators in their encryption, making it exploitable over the air. Um, the, the hardware has been completely documented and reversed, and you can write whatever you want to run inside of this. Um, my favorite thing that I wrote for this was when I had the privilege of collaborating with uh, Sandy Clark, Matt Blaze, uh, Perry Metzger and some of the other fine folks at UPenn. Um, we wrote a reflexive jammer for APCO P25 police radios so that when the packet comes in, it then transmits during only the destination address field, which causes the receiver to believe that the packet was intended for someone else. Uh, and it's able to do this by transmitting only 0.3% of the time. Um, we, we only ran this on, um, on amateur radio frequencies. Um, we got all sorts of phone calls from like, uh, every fire department that was having trouble with reliability in their network. Um, there's a lot that could be done in making these radios more reliable that needs to be done, uh, such as automatic failover when the tower is out of range. Um, hopefully the, uh, those sorts of things will be written. And then, um, the, the next temp badge that I showed you earlier, its Nordic RF chip is compatible with the ones used in Microsoft wireless keyboards. So, um, Max Moser and Torsten Schroeder made this uh, hardware called Kikariki that used uh, custom hardware in order to sniff the start of frame delimiter in order to promiscuously sniff Nordic RF devices. Um, Using a Kikariki, I could have known that the um, the turning point clicker's secret number was one two three four five six without having to re reverse engineer it. Uh, so in 2010, I figured out how to port that technique to run entirely in software with no custom hardware, and got that running on the next hope badge. So here on the right, you see um, a macOS text editor, uh, and a string is being typed in. And those same key presses are being caught by the next hook badge over the air because the closest thing to encryption that the Microsoft keyboards were using at the time was XOR uh, with their own address. Um, since then, there's been uh, Mousetrack and many other projects that are playing with these devices as, um, as these sort of like dongle keyboards and, and projector remotes. As they added encryption, it was optional. So you wouldn't be able to know what was sent over the network, but you could inject new, um, 
new packets. Um, mouse jack uses this to inject key presses into a mouse because in USB they're the same thing. Um, and aside from the, the stylish lines in Studebaker's 1964 cruiser lineup, uh, that's all I have for you this evening. So I hope you enjoyed it.